Afrika, hoor. Zeewaal. En ik ben speciaal blij om alle onze sprekers en gasten te welkomen die meer dan 20 Europese en Afrikaanse landen uit deze conferentie vandaag zijn. Dank u inderdaad voor het komen, voor het bezoeken en het bespreken met ons deze belangrijke thema's. Before we start, I want to say also thank you to the co-organizers of the conference today, the Africa-Europe Diaspora Development Platform, ADEPT, and Radio Africa TV. The event today is part of a European-wide dialogue process started by ADEPT entitled Development Diaspora Forum, which aims to organize an exchange between diaspora organizations and development policy figures. La question qui va nous occuper peut-être c'est pourquoi maintenant? Pourquoi maintenant les gens font des kilomètres et kilomètres pour venir en Autriche, spécialement en Allemagne? Et mais ce flux de situation a longtemps fait oublier que la mer Méditerranée a engrigite tous les jours les ressortissants venus d'autres pays, spécialement africains. It is necessary that development policy reacts more to the political and economical instabilities in the countries of origin. In regards to that, migrants and diaspora organizations can play an important role. Et même le nouvel instrument de communication que euh, la page. Applaudissons, mes chers amis, madame, mesdemoiselles, messieurs, cette équipe de Londres. Dining up from Kenyans in diaspora Austria, Kida, reported on their support program for peace and youth work in Kenya. These African diaspora youth leaders are not only brilliant and dynamic, but are committed to ensuring that this forum is one of the tools for capacity building for African diaspora youth here in Austria. So together we were able to divide this topic into namely two, which is long-term and short-term approaches or perspectives. The, the participation or the contribution of the, the, African, the African living in Europe to the African development also in time of crisis. And the point we came with, uh, uh, diaspora perspective in Europe and Africa, the diaspora need to adopt and enhance and encourage initiatives like entrepreneurship development, which is a way to confront social and economic issues, which is basically, which is basically will influence the political issues. want to check out whether you agree with our solution or uh, whether you don't agree. So uh, I will put this, uh, those statements through and uh, every time you agree you will show a, a red card. Uh, no, yes, it's green, green card. Have you seen your green card? Yes, so if I put a statement, say I agree with this statement, you will show the card. And if uh, you don't agree, you show the orange one, yeah, and if you are like... Up to now, Kida does not receive any support from Austria. However, with the existence of ADAPT, changes will occur. According to the networking members, Aging Europe should notice the potentials of migrants and use these. Une entreprise, Madeleine Casalis, une entreprise de cosmétiques. Donc, ils connaissaient effectivement bien tout ce qui est processus de création d'entreprise, etc. Avec tout le lancement, euh, le côté lancement financier, etc. On a cette force, on peut s'en servir pour pouvoir créer des choses euh, sur le terrain. Coming to a sobering conclusion, there still does not exist any strategic plan in Europe how to cope with the increasing migration. Um, this time, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, we. Statistics show us that um, the European population is aging dramatically. 
and that we know that to be able to maintain the pace of uh, development and the, the quality of life that we have in Europe, that we will have to bring in people. And we have people who are coming in. We have people who are coming in and we're kind of blogging. And I just think if we take away the stamp, you know, that, that, that stamp that we put on people, they are refugees and immigrants, and just see the people behind them, then we will see how much resources they are bringing on the table. I strongly believe that if we want to look at these people from that position, that they're bringing in resources. Just look around. Did anyone know that? Um, I just read recently that I'm not doing anyone a favor. You're doing your country and yourself a favor. You don't know who, which, of, which one of the refugees is going to take care of your parents or yourself when you're in the hospital or when you get old. I think we should start talking from a human perspective, saying that someone said it, we are interconnected. Uh, we should talk from a humanness perspective. This is something that I learned from South Africa. It's part of the African Ubuntu. If we try to you know, put this on the forefront of our discussion, I think we may be moving a little bit more faster you, and not wasting Beatrice. time. Similarly, migration expert Ms. Piril Ejiban shares her view by calling Good morning, Europe. Since 2011, Turkey has taken 2.2 million Syrians and, in addition, 200,000 Afghans, Iraqis and Somalis. In Turkey, uh, on the table for discussion, um, Turkey is now uh, the country with the, uh, with hosting the biggest uh, refugee population in the world. Uh, it wasn't so five years ago. Five years, uh, five six years ago, we had only about <coughs> 20 to 30,000 uh, refugees in Turkey. Uh, but uh, all of a sudden, uh, now uh, today, uh, we have more than two and a half million refugees in Turkey. 2.2 million of them are uh, Syrian refugees, uh, and about. Um, 200,000 uh, of them from other countries, basically from Iraq, from Afghanistan, Iran, Somalia, uh, and uh, other uh, countries. Apart from networking among diaspora, humanitarian and developmental organizations, the focus lied on evaluating the European refugee policy, exemplified by the situations in Turkey, Greece, Italy and Austria. Very fine. Good morning, everyone. Everyone, I was invited to speak a little bit about the international uh, framework on refugee protection, and um, I'm sure that many of you uh, already know um, and have an idea about uh, the, the meaning and the content of uh, international law, uh, especially international and human rights law. Nevertheless, I want to mention some of the instruments that uh, have been developed in the last 70 years, let's say, like this. And um, I think worth to mention are a lot of UN conventions, for example, those uh, conventions to prevent torture or to combat uh, discrimination, or one uh, instrument more recently um, signed by member states uh, are, uh, is the, the right of the child, the Convention of uh, the Right of the Child. So um, we, we have a, lo a lot of such uh, international law and uh, countries that have signed these instruments have the obligation to keep these uh, rights and to protect these uh, insurance rights. It's a great pleasure and privilege on behalf of ADEPT and the ADEPT Network to be with you here in Vienna and we take the opportunity to thank Michael and VIDC and Alexi and Radio Africa for the cooperation and the warm welcome. The assumption we make in running our countries and running our lives is that there will be progression. The story of humankind is the story of solving problems for progression. So this is the normative framework. Now, crises and difficulties are supposed to be exceptions that we deal with, but the trajectory is one of progression. We try 
through complex mechanisms, through international organizations, and through conventions and laws to cement and guarantee some of the fundamental rights and privileges of being a human being. We've heard from Anna examples of such conventions and in her lovely phrase, the bits that are crisis resistant and the ones that are not. We've heard about the humanitarian protections, the refugee protections. Within the same framework, there are also proactive conventions, agreements on socioeconomic development frameworks. And in recent years, there are ones that link migration and development as a nexus of positivity and progression rather than one of crisis. The whole world in general have agreed this as well. Just to mention in more recent agreements on that would be the 2013 United Nations High Level Dialogue on Migration and Development when the UN Secretary General issued an 8.5 year plan. Last week, weekend, the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted. Although everyone is not very happy with the wording in this new framework, but there is, without any doubt, positive linkages and recognition of migration as a force for development. DD3 takes place at a crucial time for development and migration policy and practice. The Sustainable Development Goals are being adopted at the UN Summit in New York from September 25th to 27th and the 8th Global Forum on Migration and Development takes place in Istanbul in October 2015. Against the background of the current refugee crisis, the 3rd European Dialogue Forum Migration and Development took place on September 30th in Vienna. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's also an honor to you know, wrap up such a rich discussion uh, with this final panel discussion. And um, I would like to start on this way ahead, uh, going back to our title of the full day, Migration and Development in Times of Crisis, Common Obligations and Collective Action. So these common obligations we have been discussing examples of collective action, where is it that we will be heading now? Jibril said this morning, and, and it has probably been mentioned also elsewhere, that uh, just uh, last weekend, you know, Friday, the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted and for the first time really in the development discussion and development policy agenda globally, migration and migrants have been specifically mentioned and recognized. Their migrants' contributions to development is specifically mentioned in, this, in these goals, in these targets and indicators. For the next 15 years, this is the, the global development agenda. And I would like that to be the overall framework and uh, sort of the long-term perspective in, in thinking about the way ahead, especially as, as Jibril also mentioned, that in terms of looking at the typology of what crisis is, crisis has to be short-term. So um, where should we go and, and how do we keep our focus and, and how do we prioritize? What, should the, what can the various institutions uh, represented here do and, and what is uh, everybody's role uh, to, to, to move forward? So I would like to give the floor to all of our distinguished panelists to introduce themselves and, and sort of contextualize uh, their work with uh, today's topic. So that is uh, what uh, each of these um, institutions and agencies represented here do on migration and development or specifically on diaspora and diaspora engagement uh, and also on, on creating the enabling environment for migrants and, and diasporas to uh, contribute, be it here or be it in Africa. So I would like to start with uh, basically following the list that we have in our agenda with Mr. Robert Seiner from the Austrian Development Agency, please. Thank you very much. Uh, 
it's also a big pleasure for me to be here and to have this opportunity to discuss a very important issue and a very, in recent days, of course, a very burning issue. Um, Austrian Development Corporation, I'm coming from the Austrian Development Agency, which, which is the operational unit uh, to implement bilateral Austrian Development Corporation. So we are only partly implementing Austrian Development Corporation. Our uh, strat strategic oriented uh, uh, entity is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we are oper operationalizing. So if you allow me, I will give the word to Mr. John Kellogg, please. Um, my name's John Kellogg. Um, I'm the advisor for fundamental rights issues and policies at the European Union's Agency for Fundamental Rights. Agency for Fundamental Rights is basically an independent body created by the European Union to advise it on, you know, obviously on human rights issues and also on broader issues related to uh, racism, xenophobia, um, integration, uh, cohesion issues. The issue of a directorate for diaspora is uh, relatively new and uh, this uh, it's about five years uh, since it was, uh, it was started and uh, it was started because of the push of the Kenyan diaspora that lobbied for this office to be established uh, as one of the directorates in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and it is a major government uh, department. His Excellency the President, our President, recognized the Kenyan diaspora as one of the 48th county. Kenya has got 47 counties. So the 48th county of Kenya is, is, the, Kenya, is the Kenyan diaspora. And this really you know, shows the position of the Kenyan diaspora in our national development. Um, I would like to give the word to um, Yvonne Dialasali, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marlene. Is it working? Yes. I'm very pleased to be here and to spend the day with you. Uh, very interesting discussions. And I'm particularly happy for, I would say, three reasons. One, it's the first meeting that many of us hold and exchanges since uh, the Agenda 2030 has been officially passed. I think we'll come back uh, to that at the later point. Um, I'm also happy to see so many different actors represented, civil society, diaspora organizations, governments, international organizations, etc., etc. I think it's a unique uh, moment uh, to exchange and to be able to share experiences, challenges, but also best practices. And I think that's what we, what we should focus on to exchange on, on, on where we have opportunities to, to do something. Um, the word opportunities, um, I work in uh, the global program migration and development where I'm heading the uh, diaspora portfolio uh, with the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation as part of uh, the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, we believe uh, that migration uh, is a very positive factor for development um, if the conditions are safe, um, the safe conditions for migration, and if the required framework conditions um, exist. Uh, let's uh, go back then to a European perspective. Um, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Tine Hülesha from the European Commission. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to follow up on, on what my colleague here said. Um, I spent the past five years in Jordan, and uh, also Jordan is hosting a lot of migrants and more than 600,000 Syrians. So again, I think the questioning the whole terminology of crisis is, is very, very important at the outset. Um, I work for the European Commission, but of course the European Commission is not one entity. We have many different departments within the European Commission. I work for the development um, arm of the European Commission. We also have a ministry, or we call them Director General, dealing with migration and home affairs. We have a, a department dealing with humanitarian interventions called ECHO. We have lots of different institutions at the European level. We have the Council, we have the European Parliament, as you heard referred to earlier. Uh, so in terms of migration, in the, in the past, it's been um, migration and development, and the nexus between migration and development, it has been in the past um, treated as rather separately. And I think within the past five years, we have increasingly recognized the link between the two and that we cannot look at the two 
two things separately. Migration has an impact on development, and development has an impact on migration. Finish here. Uh, maybe just to mention in the end that um, there's, a, there's an upcoming conference. I think one of the colleagues referred to it this morning. Uh, it might have been mentioned if, by the AU if they were here. There's a migration conference coming up in, in Malta in November. Two, I think it's on the 14th and 15th. This will tackle the root causes of irregular migration in Africa. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, so we heard already that uh, from the European Commission side there will be a trust fund and funding will increase. So um, whether or not we call this a crisis or not, we know that the attention is much more on migration currently and that this can also be an opportunity. Last but absolutely not least, Jibril Fall, you're here. Uh, again, of course, uh, on this final panel, what mm. would you like to say uh, to the way forward and, and the role of ADEPT? A um, couple of things mentioned. For example, Washington mentioned the role of the diaspora maybe in lobbying within the EU. I think the platform would particularly want to play a role in that. In, on matters that are sort of transnational, the platform can be a representative in that sense. But on specific country level, the platform can also help find the experts and people um, with knowledge relating to Kenya or Cameroon or whatever, and the diaspora from those countries to, to work with their countries of origin. In terms of, we did mention the summit, the Valletta summit in November. This is the third one. The second one was um, in May, and it was also in Malta. And it was, again, looking at irregular and what we then call dysfunctional migration. That is, my, when migration is actually bad for every party. And the reason why we thought we would introduce that is because if we don't, us, the pro-migration people, if we don't debate the difficult part amongst ourselves, the anti-migration people will indeed debate it for us. And they would set the agenda and the tone, which I can promise you will not be to our benefit. In terms of the way forward, that's also my view that we shouldn't just be complaining that we don't like the narrative. We have to offer an alternative narrative and then push for that to see whether that's acceptable. So at this stage, those are the comments I would make. I have had conversations during the day, and some people have suggested that some of the points mentioned throughout the day, we should see whether we can capture it in a form of communique. And I've taken the liberty of just drafting six brief points, which perhaps later on we can put on the slide and just have a look at. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us. It was a long day, but I think it was very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you all.